Կանադայի հայտադի հանցնախում պգիրագի թեք դեմպեր երեկին հայգետրոնի մեջ կազմագերվեց խորրդաժողովմը կանադագան բատմություններ 150 ծեղասպանություն, պազմա մշագույթ և մարդկային իրավունքներ խորակրով։ Այս միորիայ Ներգաները նաև արիտ ունեցան խոսելու և ուն գնտրելու այս թեմայի թժվարություններուն և բադեղություններում մասին։ Ձեզիգը ներգայացնենք մասեր այս նախացերնութեն են։ It's also an opportunity for us to look at Canada's response uh, to genocide of the 20th century. At this conference, we have three panels. Uh, Canada's response to genocide, the evolution of Canadian multiculturalism, and Canada's role as an international human rights leader. Uh, we often may take for granted the mutual respect for and among Canada's ethnic and cultural groups, but we should remember that it was not always the case. The concept of multiculturalism came out of debates around bilingualism and biculturalism in the 1960s. Ukrainian Canadian groups were particularly vocal in expressing concerns that the cultural contributions of all ethnic groups be heard. It was Senator Paul Yuzik who, referring to Canada as a multicultural nation in his speech uh, in, the, uh, in the Senate in 1964, launched a national debate. Today, he's acknowledged as one of the fathers of Canada's multiculturalism. And in October uh, 8, 1971, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau announced in the House of Commons that the policies of bilingualism and multiculturalism would be implemented in Canada. The next day, he reiterated the government's support for, I quote, cultivation and use of many languages at the 10th Congress of the Ukrainian Canadian Committee, today the Congress, in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Now, most of you may be familiar with this policy, but for those who are not, for more than a century, Indian residential schools separated 150,000 Indigenous children from their families and communities. And in 2008, the federal government issued a formal apology on behalf of Canadians for the Indian residential school system. And in that apology, they acknowledged that the two primary objectives of Indian residential schools was to remove and isolate children from the influences of their homes, their families, their traditions, and their cultures, and to assimilate them into the dominant culture. To me, we have another generation of First Nations children who are gonna to continue to suffer the consequences. And I can't help but ask myself, when will this stop? Now, I could have focused this presentation this morning on a number of Canadian policies that target or disproportionately impact Indigenous peoples in this country. Policies like the Indian Act status provisions that continue to disenfranchise Indigenous peoples from their communities. And I hope that part of this discussion today We'll, we'll focus on what can we do collectively as a community to make sure that these atrocities that occurred historically don't continue. Those patterns don't continue to repeat themselves in the future because that's the path we are headed on right now. Our first question I'll be asking the panelists uh, and we'll begin with uh, Dr. Kapilian Churchill for the responses and then Dr. and, and then Professor Sisson and then our member of parliament, uh, Janice. Um, the first question is, during the Holocaust and Holodomor, there were already large Jewish and Ukrainian communities in Canada. In contrast, during the Armenian genocide, the Armenian community in Canada was relatively small. How did the existence of these communities in Canada affect the Canadian response to these genocides? I will trace uh, three parallel responses to the Armenian Genocide. Bearing in mind, it went from 1915 to 1923. The first one is the Canadian government's response with special emphasis 
on the immigration policy, regulations, and uh, uh, practice, that is to say the immigration program. The second is the response of the Canadian public with an emphasis on Canadian Protestantism. And thirdly, the role of Armenian Canadians. A number of precedents were set in Canada in the early decades of the last century. Before 1914, the Armenian community in Canada was very small, perhaps 15, 1600 people. They were inexperienced in Canadian ways and lacked the confidence of language skills to, uh, that was necessary to negotiate with the federal government. And they didn't create a strong organization to negotiate with the federal people to bring in their, their, their relatives and to help in the resettlement of Armenians. This came much later with the Canadian Armenian Congress in the 1950s and 60s. Now, of course, as was mentioned in the question, the Ukrainians were in quite a different situation. Uh, there were up to 300,000 Ukrainians in Canada at the time of the Holodomor in 1933. Our statistics are not always precise in, in these matters. They constituted a very important part of the population of the Canadian prairie. And in, as such, they were noticed by Canadian government officials and already had elected representation to the Canadian Parliament. Now, if anyone uh, who looked at the matter realized that the Armenian genocide had occurred, that, that Armenian survivors were reaching Western Europe, the United States, and other such countries, and told their tales of what had happened, this was not the case for the Ukrainian Holodomor. That is, survivors did not reach the West and Canada until after World War II. And therefore, the Soviet authorities had considerable success in denying that any famine had occurred, and above all, that any intentionality of the famine and uh, its use against what might be called Ukrainian national aspirations, above all, against Ukraine. We have developed legal doctrines around identifying genocides. Uh, we have uh, progressed in terms of recognition, uh, in terms of understanding the importance of education around uh, these, these terrible crimes. Uh, and uh, hopefully, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that, that we do uh, better at, the, at the, the willingness to accept refugees who are victims of these kinds of crimes. Uh, but in terms of identifying and stopping violence against the innocent while it's happening, uh, I, I think it is fairly clear if you look at kind of the continuing pattern uh, through into the, the later 20th century and early 21st century uh, that nations, that non-state actors uh, still undertake this kind of violence uh, and the international community sort of every time something comes up, we, we wring our hands again and say, um, well, on the one hand, how come we let things in the past happen and we didn't do more about them? Uh, but then in the present, uh, we are um, we still have yet to develop kind of the effective political technology for responding. I think there are some changes when we talk about genocide. Uh, certainly one of the changes is, is the way you, we use technology. And I think the Rohingya is a good example. Uh, many people I know who don't follow world affairs closely know about the Rohingya because of the pictures, because the Toronto Star or the National Post will put on their front page uh, a horrible image of, of a mother and a child trying to escape. And uh, 10 or 20 years ago, that might not have happened, because somebody might not have had the technology in their hand to take a picture like that and transmit it around the world. So that part really has changed. And while it is true that people are still doing horrible, horrible things to each other around the world, the technology to document it has changed. And I think here in Canada, we've especially felt this for both emotionally for the worse, but from a policy point of view for the better, in the way we responded to that horrible picture of a small child washing up on the shore of a Greek beach. The entire structure of international law and diplomacy in this area has been built around the idea of extending the concept of individual criminal responsibility to nations. 
In fact, we even call these new entities you know, International Criminal Court, and we use the proceduralism of criminal law as it's applied to individuals, and we apply it to nations. And we have a whole typology of crime. We talk about uh, crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing, and there's a richly developed legal, legal subculture, uh, which is all about the typology of these crimes, which extends the metaphor of individual criminal responsibility to nations and to leaders. But what we've learned is this doesn't work, because individuals within societies are bound by the laws of those societies. And there's a constabulary that can come and arrest you, and there are prosecutors that can hold you to the standards of those societies. But there is no universal standard that holds nations to one single account. Um, we've tried that with the League of Nations and the United Nations and other supranational bodies, and those things tend not to work because different societies have different value systems. And what's worse is that most acts of genocide and mass murder are committed by dictators who are empowered precisely because the population is looking for a strong man to step outside of the current moral system because they see their country under some perceived threat. And all of these crimes tend to be justified under that idea. The Armenian genocide is to this day justified by many Turkish nationalists by saying that this was a military necessity that was needed to protect the state. The genocides occurred before the enaction of multicultural policies and a time when Canadian society still held substantial prejudices against British and non-Northern European groups. To what degree did these prejudices play a role in Canada's response to these genocides? I think there's no doubt that uh, our patterns of immigration and our uh, tolerances, for want of a better word, uh, played a significant role. And what I mean by that is that when you talk about uh, the Armenian Genocide, when you talk about the Holocaust, when you talk about the Holodomor uh, and those uh, early or mid-20th century phenomena, what you were talking about is a time when Canada, as you had mentioned in your opening, uh, where policies like none is too many uh, were the policy, were de rigueur, where there was a lack of understanding and perhaps uh, as not as much of an exposure in terms of internationally what was going on overseas. I don't mean that to say that Canada was parochial or provincial, but there was certainly, uh, in respect of the Holodomor in particular, just a, a genuine lack of understanding of what Stalin was doing through, uh, through genocide, through famine uh, in the 1930s. We've heard this morning some very remarkable social and societal non-governmental responses from Canadians. We've also heard of the impediments for action uh, against such atrocities, be they ideological or the political technology deficit, to, to repeat a phrase, or even the strategic priorities. This particular part of the world doesn't fit with our strategic priorities. But if prejudice was a dominant factor in the past, then this perhaps also speaks volumes if we look at a diachronic comparison between pre-Raphael Lemkin, pre-1948, looking at Canada's response to Armenia, to the Holodomor, to the Holocaust, versus Canada's response in the 1980s, the 1990s, and even today. So our response as a country to Rwanda, to Srebrenica, Mount Sinjar, to the Rohingya, we would like to think that today we are better equipped and more focused on uh, responding through the perspective of human rights, and yet how then do we explain our inaction or our slow movement towards action? Surely there is much to do and there is urgency attached. At the same time, Jessica Labranche reminded us this morning of very critical and unresolved matters related to genocide here in Canada. And um, I think that's a set of very difficult and complicated challenges that we face. So I would say yes, <laughs> but I would like to qualify it, that uh, it's not just a reflection of prejudice and bias. Every time I've been faced with Islamophobia, my answer has never been I'm not a Muslim. It has always been that hate is wrong, period. That's it. But the reason for that is very important because hate is like a fire. Once we allow hate to grow, it spreads. 
and it spreads, and it means that we'll see an increase. If we allow Islamophobia to grow, we've seen the connection to anti-Semitism. We've seen the connection to allowing the climate to begin to hate someone based on their sexuality, their gender, or other factors. We need to collectively denounce the act of hate, any policies, or any legislation that encourage that sort of divisive politics. It's our, res our collective responsibility. <laughs>
Համասկային հայգրթագան եմ մշագութային միության կլացոր մասնաջուղի կրագան հանցնախումպը կազմագերված է փոքրերու պադմության ժամ և ծերային աշխադանք սուրպ ծնընթյան և ամանորի նվիրված։ Չորսեն ու� Կաշապատ հարսյած սեզ դեսնելու իսով գպագենք մեր այսրվա հայդակիրը։ Սեր ձանսումներուն գամ նվիրադվության համար գրնակ թիմել հետևյալ եչ նամագի հասցեին։ Սդեսություն։